record it first. Um, okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here and joining us in our next guest lecture series 2022. Now we have Jennifer Day with us. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, Roro. Hi, thank you for making time to give a lecture here. Um, today, uh, Jennifer will talk about the ethical part of research. Uh, it is entitled Trading the Other, Ethical Dilemmas in Research. Um, before I start, I will read um, Jennifer's bio. Associate Professor Jennifer Day recently completed her doctoral work in the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Her most recent work examined the effect of resettlement at the urban periphery for Shanghai household, which a focus on vulnerable population. Her work continues in Chinese cities with research interests that include transport capacity building, outcomes of rebuilding urban villages, and the consequences of an of an alternatives to urban expansion. Additionally, Jennifer's teaching and research interests include planning for resettlement zones and urbanization in the de developing world. Um, I also want to um, uh, remind you that this guest lecture is part of the collaboration between the School of Architecture, Planning and Policy Depart Development of ITB and the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, the University of Melbourne. Okay. So without a further ado, wait, hold on. I have to remind you all that if you have a question during the lecture, please, please feel free to drop it in the chat box. We can discuss it later after the lecture ends or else you can raise your hand after the lecture so that we can have a direct discussion with Jennifer. Okay, without a further ado, I would like to invite Jennifer to deliver the presentation. Please, Jennifer. Thanks, Roro. Thanks for the warm welcome. Um, and I should uh, probably update my profile. Uh, I've, I've, I, is indeed correct that I do work a lot in China, and a lot of this presentation actually is focused on some much more recent work in the South Pacific um, and ethical problems that come up in the process of um, building an academic career that extends that work on China. Um, but into a different setting. So thank you, Roro. Thank you, Weedy. Thank you, Professor Larasati, for having me here. It's really, uh, I always enjoy being part of what you're doing at ITB and, um, you know, really excited to have this relationship and um, to continue it. So, um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the, that I'm currently joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today about some of the ethical dilemmas that come up for me as I build an academic career uh, that is focused on violent, horrific, devastating evictions. Um, it's a really funny place to be as a researcher. And I think many of you will probably understand what I mean when, when you look at your, your research objects and the things that are interesting to you from a research perspective, and you realize that they are some of the most horrible things that happen to people in their lives. And so what we're doing when we build a career or a thesis or even a set of research interests on the horrors of other people's lives is something that I think that I've had to really examine and, and ethically consider. And so I've that's sent me on a journey that I have, some of which I will try to communicate to you here. Um, and, and, um, and particularly the research ethics component of it. Um, so the title of it is, the title of the talk is Trading the Other Ethical Dilemmas in Research. That idea of trading the other um, comes from Linda Tuhiwai Smith's uh, book on decolonizing methodologies, where Tuhiwai Smith argues that research can be a tool of oppression and marginalization. And um, so, to Huey Smith writes from uh, Aotearoa from a Maori perspective. Um, Aotearoa is 
the colonized name of that country is New Zealand. Um, and she focuses on the idea of decolonizing in research. And she kind of ide identifies what that means, a process that engages with imperialism and colonialism. And she's specifically looking at that um, in, from the perspective of researching. So for her, in research, decolonizing is a process of seeing the effects of imperialism and acknowledging that much of the imperialism we see today is a remnant, it's akin to Edward Said's idea of imperialism where sovereignty sits outside of the place rather than within the place. And colonialism being a kind of imperialism, um, but uh, it's not the only kind of imperialism. So colonialism would be the specific kind of imperialism where, um, where the imperialist occupies the land or the, the space of the colonized people. And imperialism has a much more broad ruling kind of I mean, rule. Imperialism just requires us to rule from afar or rule a distant place from another place. Um, so my work has to really take seriously the role of indigenous knowledge and indigenous sovereignty because I work in places that are still struggling to remove the burden of having been colonized. I also use frameworks um, proposed by Bagele Chilisa, a professor at the University of Botswana, whose focus is on developing research practices according to indigenous ways of understanding and according to indigenous ethics. So I'll use one of her frameworks in part to structure this lecture. She um, also has another, a, a pretty similar idea about what decolonization means. Um, and particularly in the process of conducting research, it's a, a partly about recognizing the worldviews of those who have suffered history and oppression and allowing them to communicate their frames of reference and ways of understanding, their ontologies, their epistemologies, their ways of deciding what counts as knowing and what counts as knowledge and what can be known. So um, Chalisa's framework I think is really interesting. And well, since we're talking about ethics and I've been asked to talk about ethics, it probably makes sense to spend a little bit of time defining the term. People like definitions. Um, Chalisa's definition is one I use a lot because she asks compelling questions right alongside her definition. So she says that ethics is the, um, is the regulation of conduct of a given profession or group. So our behavior, the way we operate, the way we do things, our conduct is regulated by ethics. And then right alongside that idea of ethics, she asks this question, can there be a universal idea? Can there be a universal research ethics? Is it possible for ethics to be value-free and inclusive of all knowledge systems? Or are we stuck with a lot of different ethics and how do we reconcile this? Um, I'm an American living here in Australia. You're all in Bandung, I presume, although some of you may be elsewhere in Indonesia or otherwise. So I think we can all understand the, this, you know, the idea here is that we can understand the same idea of ethics because we have a shared past and we have a set of common values when it comes to research and we have a set of common ideas about what counts as knowing. So the apparent convergence of the world onto Euro Western values for research really did tick along for a, some time until important works highlighting the imperialism of the Western research approaches started to, um, to uh, be published. And this started slowly, it didn't happen overnight. To Y. Smith wrote in 1999, Decolonizing Methodologies is the book I talked about above. Chalisa released her book in 2012. These were not the earliest movers. Edward Said wrote his world-changing book, Orientalism in 1978. Um, and the follow-up to that book, Cultural and Culture and Imperialism, extends the geography from a focus on the Middle East to the Euro West's kind of global imperialism. 
And Indonesians understand the persistence of colonization at home. Um, Pramodia Nantator's Buru Quartet, high, the, no, the group of novels highlights how the education system has been used as a tool of oppression. Um, so this is um, not new. Anantator was a novelist, not a researcher, fair enough, but the literature of a society can be transformative, informative, can be illustrative of a struggle, the struggles of a society in times when it may not be completely okay to talk about things openly, it, it's sometimes possible to tell it in story form. Internationally renowned scholars like Thomas Piketty um, have used the literature, the, the literary literature, to contextualize the places they study. And according to Chalisa, context is incredibly important in an ethics that reflects indigenous people and centers their ways of knowing. So her four categories for ethical research are these four that I've listed here. Relational accountability, respectful representation, reciprocity, and regulation. So her four R's. Um, and uh, some of you may know the four D's from Robert Severo, density, diversity, design. But these are, you know, four R's. People like like to have, uh, 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 you know, mnemonic devices, I guess. So I'm going to skip around a bit in these categories. Um, but right now, let's look at the first one, relational accountability. Um, starting at the beginning of the research process, when I design a research question, uh, the first part of what I have to do is just is figure out what to ask. I look, might look at my context, I might look around at what's going on in the world, I might look at current events, I might think I have a question, a, a problem I know I want to solve and decide what question fits with that. So anyone who has done this already knows how hard it is to do the research question phase of research. Um, supervisors are never happy with the research questions, I think. Some of you may have experienced that, you know, you're in week 15 of your thesis or the six month mark and your research question is, your advisor is still asking you, now let's go back to the research question and talk about this. Roro's smiling. So I can, I can tell that that's a, a, an experience that rings true. And I can tell you that's a question I ask of my, my own research all the time and of my students. So I don't know if, you know, I, I'm, when we're asking questions, um, Chalisa's framework not only requires us to think of an interesting question that we're interested in understanding, but also to think about, am I the right person to ask that question? Um, could the compiled evidence harm anybody? Does it have the capacity to help people, not just not harm them? And that's actually a distinction I'm going to dwell on a bit that Chalisa uh, tells us to dwell on. So to give you a bit of background on what I do, I research social movements that resist eviction. One of the community groups I've been working with uh, in recent times is the Elang Etas Community Association, which is a grassroots community development initiative started by members of a community, Elang Etas, um, when their community was threatened by a conflict between claimants to this customary land. Um, and now the organization has more than 200 families in its membership. Its purpose is to resist its own eviction. Um, and so in 2018, they started, they, they launched the movement of organizing households to resist being evicted. And one of the things they did to develop a community identity was, uh, produced its own census. So this is a place, I, I resist calling it an informal settlement and a, it's for reasons I will share with you, but um, the main reason is because this is not a place where people don't have permission to live. It's just that the permission is not written down, it's historical, it goes back decades, it comes from oral history, but that doesn't mean it's not a legitimate form of permission. Um, so in order to begin its social movement, the community developed a, a charter and a constitution. Um, it started having marches to um, demonstrate support for the community for this place and the advocacy of it as an acknowledgement of it being part of the city. 
a legitimate part of the city and not an informal settlement. So um, the community, one of the things they did was uh, developed its own census to count the population. And we discussed this. I, I, um, I was in deep conversation at this point with the members of the executive committee. And they said, Jenny, we're going to do this census and we need you, you know, you're a professor, you know how to write things, you know how to analyze, you know how to do statistics. We need you to do a community profile. And so I, um, uh, so that, so we did that, but as part of the decision about whether or not to put a, and how to express this community as a place. We had to have this conversation about the community putting itself at risk by, by presenting what, uh, by presenting itself as, you know, 3000 people where the census of the country up to that point didn't acknowledge this as a heavily populated area. So the risk, and you know, according to like James C. Scott's ideas of seeing like a state, that once the state can see you, you you become even more at risk. So one of the one of the conversations we had to have was: Is this a question we should be asking of this population? Should we be doing this kind of data collection and then compiling it into a report and then publishing the report online? Is this something the community wants to do, given that? these kinds of moves can have the effect of having the government go, oh, look, this is a community. We need to provide roads and lighting and security. Or, oh, this is a community and they don't really have a, a, a written agreement to be there. Maybe we should run the bulldozers and, and evict these people. So that was the dilemma um, that the community struggled long and hard over, ultimately decided to uh, produce the report and not publish it. So that's the cover that you see. Um, it's a known document, but it's not um, published online anywhere. Um, so compiling this community profile could actually cause harm. Um, and the harm is material. Um, the This is a one of the many newspaper articles of about various evictions happening in Port Villa. Um, and I'll describe the setting in a minute. Uh, but the, the, the harm is that um, often I've met children who were inside of the houses when the bulldozers started rolling over them, um, who age three uh, were there and at age six still remember the event. Um, these are horribly traumatic events in people's lives. And this raises another set of ethical distinctions that Chalisa describes. Um, Western constructs of ethics simply require that the researcher not do any harm to the research subject. So when I was discussing the communities, uh, you know, with the community about whether or not they wanted a community profile, the thing that I was thinking was, we shouldn't do any harm. And that was brought about by my training in research ethics in the West, which just simply say, do no harm. It's a very biomedical, bioethical um, idea that comes from medicine and medical experimentation. Western constructs of ethics simply require the researcher to not do anything harmful to the research subject. Um, there's generally no ethical requirement that participants benefit from the work. And the idea I think is that the whole society will benefit ultimately from the research, which justifies it even if actual participants in the research don't see any direct benefit. And I've spent a lot of my career handing out plain language statements and ethics materials from the university that says, there is no benefit to you for participating in this research which is a very utilitarian idea. Doing no harm would mean observing an eviction without offering support, acknowledging the harmful and long-term effects, giving people a shoulder to cry on, offering some other kind of help, like helping people move their things. Um, 
And this actually interferes with one of my greatest fears that I have always going into the field, which is I won't be able to help people. I will run to the end of my capacity to help people. Um, so according to Chalisa, decolonized research principles require us to go beyond doing no harm. Decolonized research principles actually require reciprocity. Reciprocity means that the researcher and the, the impacted communities or the participating people benefit from the research. It's really easy to see how the researcher benefits from the research. I am a researcher, I get paid to do research, I get promoted when I do research, when I publish in better journals, which are, um, you know, are more likely to publish things if they're more interesting. I, I get economic remuneration, I get the esteem of colleagues, I get invited to do talks at ITB. Um, so all of those things benefit me as the researcher. And the idea of reciprocity is that the benefits to the community should be as important in a research process. So Chilisa's framework requires that benefit to the community is included. Um, this is the reciprocity component and um, she describes it's focused on the communality, communality of knowledge. The idea that knowledge belongs to no one and also respect for the connectivity between people. Um, we're all part of the same system. So where did we get this idea that doing no harm is enough? In a word, modernism. The social sciences styled themselves on the scientific methods they saw working so well for the credibility of scientists after the European enlightenment that began in the 17th century. And the scientific methods have done a lot of really great things for us. You know, we've mostly gotten rid of coal, cholera and polio, and we managed to develop a vaccine for COVID-19 really quickly. I am not, I am a direct beneficiary, as are many of us, of the benefits of the scientific method. And I think that it absolutely has its place. Um, but it isn't necessarily that Western ideas are and it, well, I should say, and it's not necessarily true that Western ideas aren't useful. So I, I'm not saying we should wholesale reject um, Euro Western ideas of knowledge. There are some fantastic theories that are also useful for colonized people, both because they reveal something about the logic of colonization and because they, they attempt to structure and decolonize mora mor morality outside of the situation and into more universal principles that everybody agrees with. And that's kind of what guys like Immanuel Kant were up to. His categorical imperative from the groundwork of the metaphysical metaphysics of morals or metaphysic of morals in 1785. Um, Kant was a deontologist, so he believed that there were firm rules that apply all the time in every situation. So you could come up with, if you could just come up with these rules, they would apply all the time. Um, so for example, lying, maybe never justified, even say if it hurts someone's, if it saves someone's feelings or prevents them from being murdered because they're, the, the robber asks you where they're hiding. Um, the, according to an idea of a categorical, a categorical imperative, lying may never be justified. Um, another way I've heard the categorical ex imperative it expressed is to imagine the logical end. So if everyone lied or did extractive research where they did not contribute to the betterment of uh, the people they're researching, would we want to live in that world? Uh, John Rawls has uh, another thought experiment. So the veil of ignorance. The idea of the veil of ignorance is that you operate from a position that you could be placed in any position in that society. So if you're in a decision-making position, you could find yourself being the poorest member of that society or the most unrepresented member of that society. So it's important to make decisions from the perspective that, um, that you could be any member of that society. So, Rawls thought experiment is unfortunately impossible, but we can work around it by being aware of and discussing what we call our positionality, where, where we sit in the power structures at play in a research process. 
Um, my position in the research is informed by my underlying assumptions about who has knowledge and who assembles knowledge. And so it's important to ask who you're being when you're doing research. I've had this come up a lot. I became deeply involved with a community organization, the EECA, when I realized that a particular policy seemed to provide protections that no, nobody knew about. Um, so the Vanuatu National Displacement Policy came out in 2018 when I was right in the middle of dozens of interviews with displaced people. The policy language, even though the head, the title doesn't seem to signal it, contains protections from evictions, um, specifically the horrific types of evictions, like with bulldozers that we've been seeing in Vanuatu. So here's an example of people's homes being pushed down and people are still just hanging around. They're right there. They're, they're still working on removing materials, building materials. Um, so where is this? Um, Vanuatu is a island country down here in the, the Pacific Ocean. Um, so you all probably, you know, looking at the eastern end of Indonesia, um, Vanuatu is just down here, kind of sandwiched between New Caledonia and Fiji's over there. So it's an island archipelagic nation made of 82 islands, um, not as densely populated as Indonesia. Vanuatu has 300,000 people in total. Um, so it's a very small place. And Port Villa is the capital city. So Port Villa's uh, municipality is home to about 40,000 people and the metropolitan area um, around it has about 115,000 people as of the latest count in 2021. So it's a small, small city um, surrounded by ocean and the Elang Etas community is down here in this little, this little red highlighted area. So I started, I got, I started to understand that this policy was in play and I started training people about the protections available in the policy. And I started joining community activities and getting, getting involved in, um, uh, in organizing activities. And I started joining uh, uh, women's committees. And, um, and so all of this contributed to my positionality. My, I needed to acknowledge the, the role I was playing in this system because from a modernist construct, if I interfered with the system, then I am changing it. And therefore, how do I know the changes I've brought about are not the product of my own involvement and not what would have occurred had I not been there? So there are methods that, that allow you to deal with this, but part of this is that participation and, and one's positionality in the research has to be acknowledged. Um, core tenet of modernism is that research can, researchers can observe objectively. We're capable of watching and observing and seeing clearly and being able to relay that back. Um, and I think that's an incredible, in you know, postmodern thought in general thinks of that as a very questionable assumption of, of modernist thought. Uh, one of the things that I did as a part of this system was helped the community to articulate its vision. One of the one day we were sitting around and they were saying, "Oh, it's really hard to get people to." Um, can you hear that? There's a train going by. Do you hear the train? Is it loud? Okay. No, um, no, it's all right. One of the one of the problems the community association was having was attracting members getting the households who live nearby to be members of the association. And so I said, well, you know, maybe we should uh, write a vision statement, a, um, a mission statement. So this is, you won't be able to read this unless you um, read Bislama, um, but this is the, the, the mission statement for the community association. And it outlines the, the vision of the community of itself um, and also what the association is trying to do. So here I am definitely interfering with the system. Um, 
And so the community did ado adopt this mission statement. So here I am, definitely interfering. So this takes us back to Chalisa's framework. In a Western ethic, I have a, a problem because I'm interfering with the system. Um, and so it's, it's a research methodological problem in terms of validity and reliability. And from an ethical perspective, one might question whether or not I should be interfering the way I was. Chalisa's framework um, causes us to focus on different aspects of this relationality. So I was wondering at the time, is my activity, my involvement, my connection with this community compromising my research integrity? But whew, according to Chalisa, um, the relational accountability I had developed actually made my work more authentic and more ethical. According to Chalisa, there's no conflict in being a researcher or being part of a community because knowledge is communal. Different people may produce different components of knowledge. Like I composed the mission statement, but I didn't, I didn't come up with the ideas in the mission statement. I wrote them down and I put some color on them and, and I put them on a PDF format. So, and, uh, and so even though different people may produce different components of the knowledge, knowledge is a discursive and an interactive process. Um, so in the mission statement, I might've done the writing, but I was part of the group that assembled the knowledge. So action research methods, according to Chalisa's um, ideas and her framework, uh, are appropriate, especially when you are part of the community you're trying to study, or when you have an ethical responsibility like I did when this policy came out to start telling people about the protections offered to them. Another component of Chalisa's ethic, ethics is respectful representation. There's, um, different um sorry sorry um sorry i yeah so respectful representation and i think i just uh got my notes confused so um for the an understanding of res, res, uh respectful representation it's even hard to say all these r's all in a row um i'm going to the analysis phase of research so um a lot, I've had a lot of journal referees tell me that I've spent too much time describing my positionality. Depends on the journal, depends on the advisor, depends on the professor, depends on the peer review. Um, but I've had, I've had some say, no, you're not spending enough time telling us about your positionality. Um, but I've, I've had others, especially highly modernist journals, tell me that I've spent too much time describing who I am, who I've been in this research process. And so you're stuck with this, what do I do? Do I take it out? Do I go and find another advisor? Do I go find another journal? After all, if you've got to revise and resubmit, you're close. So you, do you really want to risk starting over with another journal? It's so hard to get things published. So the way that this came up for me, um, and this raises another really interesting and useful distinction that Chalisa describes, which is outside of that four part framework, um, was her knowledge systems. So the knowledge systems of the researched versus the knowledge systems of the researcher. Those not, may not be the same. And I think this distinctions I've been making between modernism and indigenous knowledge ethics is one example of how knowledge systems can be very different. Um, so according to Chalisa, most of us are interested in using our own knowledge system to understand the research. So for example, one thing that I am very guilty of is I, and I'm in this ethical dilemma right now, so maybe you'll have some ideas. I am, I love for some reason, French uh, constructivists. I structuralists, I, I French structuralists. I don't know why. Um, I always find the way that they write to be very easy to understand and uh, compelling. And so I've been reading a lot of Philippe Descola um, from the Collège de France, and he's um, and and trying to use De Descola's ideas about 
um, uh, to apply to my study of evictions in the South Pacific. So um, Descala has this six part framework. Maybe this will, maybe you'll understand why it's so compelling. Look at it, it just fits nicely in a little box. It's really, you know, easy to understand. Okay, the terms have to be defined, um, but it's a six part framework and it really seems to fit my data. And um, I've done this before. So I, I've, French structuralists just seem to speak to me. So I've applied French structuralism before in an indigenous context. Um, in this paper, I use Bordeaux's ideas about um, symbolic capital and, 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 and symbolic power and, and power relationships between people. Um, and an important lesson I'm really working out uh, as I prepare for this, as I prepared for this lecture was um, that even if paradigms are intended to liberate, uh, if they're not considerate of the knowledge systems that are being researched, the knowledge systems of the researched, they are not decolonized. And so what do we do? Will I continue with Descola? I'm not sure yet. Um, I'd love your thoughts. I'd really like some ideas on this one. Um, this comes up toward Chalisa's idea of regulation. So she actually, um, I think, uses rights and regulation, two, R, two more R's, but they're the same line. So um, refers to the protocols that would um, accord the colonized and marginalized ownership of the knowledge produced. I think that's how she says it. The rights and regulation refers to the protocols that would accord the colonized and the marginalized ownership of the knowledge produced. So the people who produce it should own it, not the researcher. And I can tell you that the community profile, for instance, that I helped produce with the Alang Atas community, um, they have found that to be a useful tool for negotiating with government. Um, it succeeded in getting some of the roads paved, getting electricity run to the community, um, having more police allocated to do policing there. Not to say that the community profile did all of this work, but it did do some of it. Um, and the community was able to use it as a product. So that, that was a reciprocity moment, but also um, regulation. You know, How do you hand the knowledge back over to the people that, uh, that helped produce it. So the community profile was one way to do that. I'm wondering if Descola is going to enable that kind of handover. Um, so I've argued that reproducing Vanuatu's political spatial units uncritically is uh, a way that people in Elang Atas are, are excluded from governance. So this is, um, Roro did ask me to touch on qualitative and quantitative um, ethics. And I just wanted to do some things that were explicitly quantitative. Um, there are values embedded in even something as mundane as spatial geographies. There's something called the ecological fallacy. If anybody's heard of the ecological fallacy, this is when the application of area-based averages is applied to individuals. So something about the area, they say, oh, well, you live there, you must be one of those people that has that feature. Um, so it's a logical fallacy where we interpret statistical data and make inferences about individuals before we know anything about um, them based on the group that they live in. So if I live in a census geography, but I'm not like the average person in the geography, then this can serve as a justification for not addressing my needs. Um, and I myself have criticized the reproduction of these, uh, these of spatial geographies that do not seem to match the majority of the experiences of most people in Vanuatu. Um, so publications funded by some of the dominant aid agencies operating the urban space, like UN habitats, um, tend to rely on government designations. And anyone who has spent time in the still rural designated Kabupaten around Jakarta or Bandung knows that government designations do not keep up with urbanization. Um, in Port Vila, 
rural designation makes people, most people ineligible to vote and leaves them without a lot of political representation. So another way that quantitative studies create ethical problems is that they use uncritical language to represent places. Um, this is often, again, reproduced in studies like those found in this UN Habitat study and, and this one. So this is a photo I took of uh, the settlement where I work. Um, and this is a quote from a uh, publication that was supported by UN Habitat that named that place to be an informal settlement. And actually it's not. It's not an informal settlement. It's a place with a complex customary arrangement where people, thousands of people have the right to live on this land according to an agreement they made with the landowner. So the ecological fallacy is at play here because if people are not villagers, um, they are labeled as informal. They're not from the village that's named after the geography. They're labeled as informal settlers, but that is an imported thing that comes from the development apparatus, not from the people who are governed, not from the knowledge systems of the research. So I've argued that some interim, interim kind of arrangement is at play here, and it's based on custom and it should be acknowledged. <clears throat> Um, so funding bias is a real thing. It really happens. There are a lot of meta studies in a lot of disciplines. Um, in biomedical or ecological sending, settings, funder bias looks like positive research findings in favor of a drug's effectiveness, say, or the non-harm of a polluting use or water bottle plastics. Um, in countries of the global south, funder bias can also appear in more subtle ways, like in the reproduction of funders' language and constructs, like UN Habitat's idea of informal settlements being reproduced. So these distinctions are important because they have material consequences for large amounts of funding, um, and they reproduce the worldview of the funding agency. So, uh, and its donors, and not the indigenous people who are helped or affected by the programs. So if spatial representation of people violates or only partially violates how the city is actually organized, then quantitative analysis violates <coughs> the represented affected people. Um, so, you know, is development and development research that better matches the worldview of the funder passable in our current time? Than, than research that better matches the worldview of the researched, um, or knowing what we know, and with the benefit of indigenous scholars like Chalisa spelling out the alternatives, should we be trying for a more relational accountability, which is what she calls for. Um, and uh, I probably should have advanced the slide, is development fit, that fits the worldview of the funder the right model for us now? Um, one last uh, way I will say that um, one, one last unethical thing is using the right words or the wrong words. So um, I would argue that even in qualitative and quantitative studies and even or, well in qualitative and quantitative studies, but especially in quantitative studies, respectful representation is important. It's important to use words that actually express what people think about themselves and that express their circumstances and struggle. So one thing in my work that a lot of people are inclined to say is resettlement. People were resettled, but that's a very sterile word to mean what we see, which is people's houses are pulled down with bulldozers while they are still inside. That's eviction, that's displacement, that's not resettlement. Um, we have words like inequality that are pushed around in our world right now. Um, when a generation ago, we might have said poverty or class conflict. Um, inequality, again, is uh, others have argued that it's a very sterilized word. Um, informal settlement, it's a, maybe a nice way to say something, but maybe it doesn't quite represent what's going on. So words that express the extent of the loss that people feel, um, that or or the uh, the experience that they feel. This means that we um, we can trade the other, if you will, in ways that do not require us to say uncomfortable things if we stick with those sanitized words. But 
if we depart from that language and we say what we mean, eviction, class, customer arrangements, this will improve respectful representation and will get us uh, we'll get better at it over time and it will get us more ethically aligned. So coming back to that was a bit of a a cloud of things lightly structured. Um, coming back to the idea of trading the other, the idea that I opened with, uh, in serious and important ways, all research assembles knowledge from people that are not ourselves, that are not themselves, a knowledge that belongs to others. Um, and I hope I've caused you to ask some questions about my research. Is it right for me to have built the career that earns me money as others suffer? And what are my obligations to the communities that I work with? And am I meeting them? And for you, I hope that you are already on the journey of unlearning that you may not be um, unlearning things that you may not be convinced would be worth raising as a legitimate form of knowledge. Um, what evidence have you discounted that you in the future would like to see with a more accepting gaze? What would you like to count as knowledge that right now Western Eurocentric ideas of knowledge don't allow to um, be acceptable forms of knowledge? I presented this conflict content to you in a way that um, in this way, because sometimes it's easier for us to cast the gaze of ethics on someone else's work uh, than on one's own, but you will have matured as a researcher when you know to look for your own work, look at your own work in this way. For me, I imagine that my future maturity as a researcher will involve better implementation of Chalisa's four R's, relational accountability, respectful representation, reciprocity, and regulation. And I welcome you to point out any ethical lapses that I might've missed or to ask any questions. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for a very engaging presentation. I think uh, this um, kind of raised our awareness of our positionality in our doing our research as an academic. This is what we do mostly, you know, doing research. Um, all right, so probably I invite any of you, if you want to raise question to Jennifer, you can drop it in the chat box or else you can uh, raise your hand. Um, meanwhile, probably I can start while waiting others um, question. I think um, your, your statement about positionality is um, fair. It, that hits me hard because uh, when you say that positionality, meaning that we are using underlying uh, assumption, that sometimes it's not it does not fit to the actual condition because you don't know their value because we come from other value. It's very different to what we're researching. Um, how do we kind of like understand that? How how what, how we kind of like um, adjusting to their value while we don't know we are not them? You know how to minimize the gap? Um, uh, do you think? Yeah, I, it's, like, it's like a slow awakening. And, you know, for someone who's trying to go out and do research for the first time, I think it's terrifying. Like right now, I'm going to, next week, I'm going to go back to Vanuatu and I haven't been there since before the pandemic. And I'm scared. I'm scared that I've forgotten that I, that I won't be able to, uh, or that people's values will have changed. And that's okay. I don't know why I'm scared, but I am. I'm really frightened of going to do field work. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, it sounds very simple and it isn't, but it listening, just listening all the time, as much as you can, um, asking as few questions as possible and just listening as much as possible, or I should say making as few statements as possible and just listening a lot. Um, and and I think going talking to people in conversations sort of like this one, um, I'm not claiming I've showed up here and told you anything you didn't know before, but this is all how I think about what I try to do. 
Um, if you can bring frameworks like Chalisa or like Linda Tuhiwai Smith's into your own work, you can go, ah, oh, I didn't even know I didn't even know that. And that, I think that's why I like structuralists so much like Descola because they give me this way of going, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing production. I'm doing, um, you know, predation. That's another one of his things. Um, and so having all this language is not that it makes the concept more clear. It just makes it like easier to name it and talk about it. So I get, for me, my, my strategy is get better at having names for things. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Have a lot more yeah. names, have a lot more structures, have a lot more frameworks. So when I see something, I can go, huh, that looks like respectful representation. Or am I doing respectful representation? Should I be right now? Um, how can I do that better? And then just a whole lot of listening and talking. Like I, you know, my hope, my hope was that um in telling you about my own ethical dilemma, writing about this setting that has nothing to do with French structuralism. That, um, that somebody would have a good idea and say, no, Jenny, you should absolutely not do that. That is terribly wrong. Or well, maybe it's okay. Or what if you thought about this? So I guess expressing sooner the, the doubts you have all the time, because I don't know, you don't even know, right? You don't even know when you're going to like sometimes you're like you're in the field or you're writing and you're like, well, that doesn't feel right, but I don't know why. That's okay. I just want to keep going. So I'll just and and talking to someone, calling someone up and being like, I had this little funny feeling and I don't know why. Um, and being willing to admit you don't know what you're doing, but it feels funny. And that's exactly what for me Descola is. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but it feels funny. And it feels like I'm trying to force it, but it also feels right. And I don't know how to feel about it. So you pull smart people into your, your problems. All like, you know, that's the beauty of having an academic community. We're, yeah. you know, yeah. we just, we get to, we get to call each other up and talk about this stuff. We might as well take advantage of it. That was very not helpful, was it? Just talk a lot about it, think a lot about <laughs> it, read a lot about it. But I, I do make... agree that sometimes discussion make you realize something that you didn't before, right? You know, like, uh, accepting perspective um all right um i'm still waiting for any one of you we have more than 100 people here i believe <coughs> there must be things inside your mind <laughs> that you want to like kind of like probably not always um it doesn't have to be a question or probably something that you want to share about or probably um experiences that you want to share with us and, and we have Jennifer here probably Jennifer will uh, give a point of view about what you want to share um okay um probably I I also curious um if you are part of the ethic um committee in the University of Melbourne and you've got uh so many uh ethic application we have to we as uh for your information all of uh, for all of you that in Melbourne University, we have to uh, submit ethic application and it has to be passed before we can conduct the research. So um, Jennifer, can you share what is the most common mistakes or probably um, that they usually unintentionally do that make the application kind of rejected? Okay. Do you have an institutional review process that at ITB2? Are you developing one? Yeah, we are developing, not in the current time, but we're planning to have that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, <clears throat> it's, well, I mean, uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention in my talk, and this is not, Roro, the question you asked, <laughs> but I wanted to mention this, so I, um, this is an example of bad listening, um, <clears throat> is that, um, that, uh, a lot of institutional review boards don't even address quantitative questions. So um, if you have if you're using a secondary data set like uh, um, like a census data set or Susanos or Podis or something like that, um, the institutional review boards often don't even require review of projects that are not directly interfacing with human beings. That's how it works at Melbourne University, for instance. If I'm using the census, I don't have to apply for ethics approval. 
So it kind of, you know, in terms of indigenous ethics, the, that those questions of should I be asking this question, am I the right person, am I going to do harm, can't be addressed for a lot of projects that don't even go up to be reviewed by institutional review processes. Um, <clears throat> so that's not the question. Roro asked, Roro, you asked, um, what, what are some common problems that come up um, in the review of ethics applications? Um, <clears throat> For students, uh, especially, we, uh, and this is le less to do with ethics and more to do with research design. And this is another interesting question for a person designing an institutional review process, um, is if there is a serious methodological problem with the research, is that the role of the institutional review, the ethics panel, to help them deal with? And Melbourne University, we've actually come and come down on the side of yes, that we should be um, advising people on research methods. And so it um, it gets a little funny because then you'll get a, your ethics panel will like recommend a change of title to your thesis, and people are like, why is this happening? Like, you know the and um, so the ethics people have had some problems with the the way that the research is expressed, um, <clears throat> and so one of the major problems that happens in student work is that the method and the research question are not aligned. So mm. the, the research question might be expressed qualitatively, but have a quantitative method attached to it, or the other way around, a quantitative research question, which sort of points at something that's countable, or the direction of, the effect, of an effect, or a magnitude of an effect. Um, some sort of hypothesis test, but then ha then in, has a qualitative method attached to it. So they're and not how is that. How is that not ethical? I mean, that is kind of like research problem. Yeah, it's, it's a really, methodological really, problem. Yeah, is it is it is that will it you know create an ethical probably conduct in the uh, the field work, or is it about the result that come up that might be a bit flawed or? <clears throat> The ethics comes up there in our duty to the students to make sure that they are able. So our ethics is also about the researcher um, and the, the capacity of the researcher to do the work. Um, the University of Melbourne would never send me into a war zone without a whole lot of ethics approval. I'd never go into one anyway, probably, unless I didn't have a choice. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the, they, they won't allow me to put myself in danger in order to go and do research. So the, the institution has an accountability to the researcher. And when it's students, we take that to mean also, we have accountability to make sure they're doing a project that's doable. Um, so that's where that comes in. But in terms of like violating the ethics of the research subject or violating uh, ethical protocols in relation to the research subject, the mismatch between a research question and um, and the methods is not is not a problem um, necessarily. I haven't seen a situation. I guess it's possible that <clears throat> it signals that the research is largely not very well designed, and therefore, when person goes into the field, they could just end up doing anything because they don't have a clear idea of what they're actually going to do. Um, and something our students actually do reasonably well is, um, but something that does come up occasionally is uh, informed consent and informing people what is um, what you're going to be doing in the research. So there, there are some instances where it's necessary to deceive people a little bit when it comes to research. So to not tell them exactly what you're doing because if you're doing something like a discourse analysis, um, do people study discourse analysis in research methods? Yeah, yeah. Where, where we look at the we look at the um, the things that people say and the way they say it. And the idea of a discourse analysis is that people aren't exactly number one. People aren't always truthful. So policy documents don't ex always say exactly what the decision makers were thinking. And um, 
And it may be, there may be a political reason or a personal reason why I don't tell you my, my own views on something as a policymaker. I'm not a policymaker, but if, like if I were. Um, or there may be lots of other reasons why people may choose to obscure or soften. So a lot of that literature that I've um, that I talked about where people want to soften these words, you know, they don't want to say eviction, they want to say displacement, and they don't want to say any, they, they want to say inequality, they don't want to say class conflict or poverty, because those are very confronting things. And so when you're doing a discourse analysis, you might, um, you know, one, a lot of discourse analysis has focused on sanitized words. Why are people so uncomfortable with the words that actually express what's occurred? But if you came out and said, hey, Jenny, like, why do you use inequality instead of class conflict? I'm not sure I would be able to articulate my discomfort as the reason for, for using that language. So yeah. discourse analysis allows us to, um, to not, to, to look at the subtext of what people say and like yeah. the, the kinds of things that are, so anyway, um, if you're doing a discourse analysis and you charge at people with informed consent and you say, I'm going to be studying your unconscious ways of understanding informality, then <clears throat> people, you now start to bring things to the conscious, you know, and, yeah. and again, from the perspective of a modernist, you've kind of changed your, your research system. Yeah. So, Understood. um, so, <laughs> so in, in the institutional review boards and in the ethics committees, um, Sometimes people who are looking to deceive, deceive too much. And sometimes they, they, they are too straightforward in such a way that would prompt their research subjects to tell them what they wanted to hear. Um, so you can, you can kind of, we, we end up uh, dealing with that a little bit. Um, and then uh, distress protocols are another really important thing. Like if you're if you're dealing like I do with very um, traumatic life events, not the worst. I mean, being evicted is not as bad as many things that can happen to you, but it is, you know, one of the five big stressors is moving. And that's a really extreme form of, of relocating your house. Um, what do they say? Divorce, death in the family, moving, <clears throat> um, illness. And there's one other one. Um, so, uh, so we get, uh, we get a lot of people who, um, haven't planned. So they, they will say, one of the questions that they ask is like, is there any risk to the participants? And what the, what that means is, is there any more risk than normal? Like more than usual going around your daily lives? Cause everybody's at risk of getting hit by a meteor all the time. So, um, but is there any more risk than people would normally experience in their everyday lives? And a lot of people want to like, just roll over that, you know, just real smooth, no risk. I don't see any risk. And they think that saying there's no risk means that there's no risk. Um, as part of an ethics committee, I really like to see people try at this one, you know, like, oh, what is like, you know, what is a thing you could really, like, something genuinely risky and something that comes up for me a lot is distress. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I am not a, in any way qualified to um, help people with their distress. And yet that's part of the, what I have to go to the field with is a, a way to soothe people and calm people if they do become really disconcerted by what's happened to them and reliving what's happened yeah. to them. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's ethical when you kind of like admitting, <clears throat> sorry, the possibility that you bring to the, those people instead of just denying that everything's going to be fine. Right. So. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. be willing to just like use your imagination to think of yeah. the things that could go wrong in the field. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the elaborate, very elaborate um, answer for my question. I, I have someone raising hand here, Ibu Hima Sarihanan. Uh, can you please? Yeah, thank you yes. for the opportunity. Yeah, Jennifer, uh, this topic is quite new for all of us. So could you uh, maybe inform more to us uh, how to handle of this issue as a starting point? for a better management in uh, research activities. 
especially the procedure, yeah, whether we have to, to set up a committee, the ethic committee for this, or reviewer or whatever it is. Uh, how should, uh, or what's your experience from the Melbourne Uni to manage all of this issue about ethics on research, especially for the students? Could you inform uh, more about that, please? Thank you. Ah, ah, thanks, Masari. Um, probably the worst thing about universities is they're run by people like us, right? <laughs> people who are um, just interested in going out and finding out things and um, and maybe only interested in managing people as as a necessity. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think that you know university ethics um, committees, they do their very best. Um, so, so getting them set up, I think, is number one. You start. I've never done it. I've, I've, I was born into a world where there were already ethics committees. Um, I would never be presumptuous enough to tell ITB or anybody else, not even Melbourne Uni, because, um, because this was all set up before I got there. Um, so I guess I'll take a guess. I take a guess. Um, is uh, I would start with uh, a lot of consultation if I were doing this. Like if you, if you said, Jenny, you get to start over and you can redesign Melbourne University's ethics protocols, what would I do? I think I would, um, I would start by um, doing a big consultation of all of our academics and PhD students and, and with a lot of master's students on what aspects of research ethics really matter to to them um, for instance you know is an indigenous ethics something that they want to incorporate into um, ethics protocols and uh, and do a you know consultation with other institutions that have them and I just start asking questions like how do, how do these not just how do these things run but what's the goal what's the inter institution's objectives? Um, and, and those can be multiple. I think the, you know, the cynical thing that anybody at a Western institution would tell you, or Euro Western, I guess, is that <laughs> it's the university trying not to get sued because mm. we have a very litigious system. Um, is that a concern for Indonesia? Um, and <clears throat> is the, is the, you know, because if not, then there's a, there's room for an expansive kind of ethics and a brand new kind of ethics that incorporates indigenous thought and that incorporates the 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 um the researched values <clears throat> so i guess i'd start with a big a massive like year long committee just going around and talking to everybody and figuring out um what kinds of ethics frameworks need to be included in the design um and then you should come to melbourne uni and sit in on our our ethics committees for Roro, did you ever sit in on any when you were here? No. Yeah, you mercifully um, got out of it. But a sabbatical, yeah. you know, three or four people should go on sabbatical and do a bit of a study tour of how ethics committees operate hmm. um, and just sit in on them. And and the, you know what? Anthropologists, you just get an amp. Uh, get them to study ethics committees it would be so fascinating they would love it um yeah and then after like a lot of time i would then then start to sort of manufacture format a a mission statement and a and a and a process and then i guess you got to start it right just start reviewing applications and see how they how they go mm. um are, okay. you, are you saying i'm sorry that um that you like the entire university doesn't have an ethics procedure or is it just we have, we have already at ITB we have already one okay but mostly mostly it's dealing with the, uh, the the animals or with with the health system and so on but with the architecture and with the indigenous community we haven't been so far yet so that's, and that's why the thing like all of our procedures got designed from mm -hmm. The baseline of medicine and animal research mm. um mm. which is probably a great you know modernist it's a great place to start like we do want to do no harm right mm. we do want to make sure we don't take people's tissues 
unless they offer them, you know, all those things, right? But like, if we're not taking tissues, we have other, or maybe those medical procedures need to be updated to also include indigenous ethics. Um, mm -hmm. Even though they're so-called scientific, they are mm -hmm. scientific. I, I can't, I'm not in any position to judge whether something is scientific or not, but, um, you know, maybe they also need to, to incorporate a larger, broader um, constructs of care and reciprocity mm. rather than just doing no harm, mm. but also providing no benefit. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea. So we should uh, see through the uh, thoroughly the, uh, the ethics of, of the, our colleagues and then compare with the others. And then we, we have to think how we manage uh, for the architecture uh, uh, subject or for the community subject, because it's very complex in our society. And uh, I don't know, I cannot imagine how we manage to, to restrict the, uh, the participatory approach in, in, in our research, because it's, it's our daily activities that we just talk to the people. We, we have a conversation, we have a long conversation and we made uh, some data on it, and then we, we just uh, summarize that. So when we are facing the ethical problems, that will be a, a great change to the way we are doing our field research. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. You inspired us, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Shima. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, now we have one more question in the chat box. I would invite Karina Putri, can you? Bukarina, probably you can ask directly to um, Jennifer, or do you prefer me to Karina? Are you there or not? If if not, then I would. Okay, so she's on her way. I will read it. Hello, Jenny. My name is Karina. I'm doing research about planning as a situated ethical judgment using the case of human resettlement in Pluit Reservoir in Jakarta. I have difficulty in positioning myself when writing about the case. Do you have any suggestion about the best way to position ourselves in the analysis? Should we, complete, should we completely take off our planner's head and analyze everything from the people's perspective? Or can we have a more balanced position as both as academic and as part of the community that we are researching? See, at PS, the aim of my research is to understand what constitutes as justice or the good or the right or the desirable, the desi desirable from the affected people's perspective. Kind of like a question about positioning ourselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was difficult, I think. <laughs> Karina, are you um, using any particular construct of justice? Karina, are you? Uh, can you respond to that? What I'm, what I believe in that she is doing about. Oh, that's jangan diterusin kalau orang yang nggak Okay. Agama. Yeah. Uh, I think Karina is uh, uh, doing the um, social justice, um, you know, finding the justice in the way of, um, yeah, about the justice, correct, to deciding the, the, the what just way uh, of doing between the government's perspective and the local perspective. I think that's cool. That sounds amazing. Um, <clears throat> so there's, is there, Karina, is there some, so Karina said, no, she's actually criticizing the way we are currently thinking about justice, um, which sounds to me like there is some, um, some way or some framework that maybe the government has put forward and said, this is what we mean by justice, or yeah. this is what a just city looks like. Yeah. Um, and then your critique is uh, comparing people's responses to their own ideas of justice, to the framework that the, say, a government has put out? Yes, that's correct. That's yeah, that sounds fantastic. I mean, that sounds like, that's like somebody, um, uh, which is the component, would it be um, not responsible, respectful, represent, well, it's respectful representation in that it 
is really about representing someone whose ideas may not be aligned with that, that idea of justice. Um, so when the question was, sorry. Um, so how to position, oh, how uh, to position whether, yourself. yeah, um, either using the perspective of the planner, which is probably already informed by many kind of like a structured and well-defined um, prescription or going totally from the local's perspective in writing it, writing the research. Yeah, I mean, I think Roro's, you know, really got a handle on this. It's, um, you know, the planner, as a planner, are you a planner, Karina? Yes, yes. You, I'm, I'm talking about her because I know her. <laughs> right, actually. Do you know her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got all this pre-established knowledge, this institutional expertise that when you're in the office, you're like, look at me, I know all kinds of stuff. And everybody's like, look at Karina, she knows all kinds of stuff. And when you're in the field, the people may not value your the way that you represent or understand knowledge in the same ways, or that that may not be their value system. So I think as a planner, one of the things we get to do is express the planning ethic, the ethos of planning, what planning values. We play, okay, we value consultation, but what is consultation in planning? Is it um, is it something that is truly designed to bring out uh, a variety of views or is it designed to validate a certain endpoint? Um, what are we being as planners? So then I, you know, as, and then your role in planning, are you a statutory planner, a strategic planner? Um, and not, maybe not right now, because maybe right now, Karina, you're a student of, uh, of planning. So you're, you're in a, position where you don't have to be any one of those kinds of things. But if you have a background, I have a student, Shasha, who's a former um, urban planner now working on research. And so she knows she knows all of these things about urban villages uh, in China. And, and so she brings that to the research and we have to really like lay out her positionality. Okay, to her, an urban village is this, it looks like this. This is what people, uh, you know, this is what, what you do with it in government. So some of it might be spelling out your former experience so people know what position you're coming from. Some of it might be spell, you know, being really clear about what you've read and what's causing you to be influenced in a certain way or make a certain value judgment. Um, <clears throat> and then, so, and I, for me, the positionality like emerges. I'm like, oh, why do I think that? I think that because I read that thing and that thing, that one book or that one paper caused me to think that way. And so I just kind of, okay, let me say that. Let me conversationally declare that I'm influenced by Descola or I'm influenced by Susan Feinstein's idea of the just city. Um, rather than just writing about it as if it's some objective truth, you know, here's who I am in reference to this text. How many of you are, um, are comfortable writing in the first person. In other words, writing I, I am, I am being this way. Did I just, I swear I did not just put my hand up. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do I, that. I, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know, bro. It's automatic <laughs> but, now. I don't know. <laughs> but I am. I, 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 I um did, is anybody yeah, that's me. I always use I actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's very evolved, Roro. -ro. It's very postmodern yeah. turn, you know. The um we did a survey of our planning students three years ago and well the planning student society did the survey and 70 percent of them were not comfortable writing in the first person so karina's just said she's not comfortable writing in the first person in her writing mm. roro when if you are teaching students um are you are you is it is there a culture at itb that's anti-writing in the first person uh yeah, I think that's the the current culture right now because we are dominated by the scientific um, department, which is you know kind of promoting not using I. But since I work, I I was educated in for my PhD in Melbourne Uni. I kind of like everyone pushing me to say just say I. The I this is I or Q that it's all right because you know that every every research have this kind of subjectivity. Uh, and so it's okay that you kind of like acknowledging your subjectivity that this is me that actually making a point based on the literature that I already mentioned. I think 
that I would suggest probably for my students. But yeah, I mean, in Indonesia, generally, we don't really do that yet, probably. And how would a student be examined if they submitted a thesis and you weren't the examiner? Is that how it works? Would, would, would it go to examination outside of you? Um, yeah, uh, well, well, they're actually making a point, but they kind of like the author said that the author, which is them, but kind of like not saying that it's them, you know, like it's kind of, I, I don't know. I don't know where that um, culture comes from, but that's, um, Oh, it yeah, comes from modernism. Cool. I was that way too. <laughs> we all wrote high school reports. You know, we all, like, you know, the the research was conducted by the interviews were, we all did that, right? We, the interviews were conducted in October, 2017. Who did it? I did it. Let me just say yeah. it. Um, but you have to have a system, Karina, that will catch you and support you if you start doing something like that. So if you're going to get marked lower because you did that, then it's a very good adaptation to not. And um, so I guess it's a, you know, the culture has to shift a little bit at a time. Maybe you only do it in row rows class at first. <laughs> okay. And then, and you, you know, when you're writing journal articles or, and, but I think that that's a thing that one must negotiate very clearly with an advisor how is this going to be examined? If I do this, am I taking a risk? Um, should I take that risk? But I would say, Karina, that it's easy to talk about your positionality if you can write in the first person. Uh, it's, it's this weird thing if you try to do it. Like, author day went to the field and, and it's like, well, that's me, why am I? Um, so, and, and it takes courage. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I would say write courageously. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you um, for the very interesting answer. Um, I have people, uh, yeah, Buidi here is as, uh, raising hand. If we did this. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Hi, it's a <laughs> interesting topic because it's like, uh, yeah, I, I don't do myself with the indigenous people, but I'm wondering. Uh, it seems like working with indigenous people require a lot of uh, communication abilities, isn't it? You know, I met this guy once and uh -huh. I keep seeing it. His name's Tom Bamforth. No, it's this other guy and he's got this crazy mustache. It's like, like oh, this French guy um, mm -hmm. and he's wonderful and he's just, uh, and. And he said to me once, I can talk to anybody in any language uh, mm -hmm. and I don't even have to, I don't even have to know their language. And, and he's amazing. He goes all over the world. So he's part of the, do you guys know the, like the global shelter mm -hmm. um, humanitarian system where they, you know, they respond to shelter crises, like refugee crises and set up shelters and camps for people. And and help you know get tarps and and you know after cyclones and earthquakes and that sort of thing um so he's part of the um international federation of red cross um mm -hmm. global shelter cluster system and i've seen him in action and he's right he can engage with people teach people with only the most basic of connection human skills Okay. not all of them related to language. So he's just mm -hmm. so empathetic and so able to connect with people that people feel really close to him. And I, I'm like, I'm not like that. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really nervous. People are going to reject me. I'm like, they're not going to want me here. They don't want me. They don't want me in their house. They want me to go away. That's like my feeling. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm just like, on here on borrowed time, but he's like, no, these people, like, they want me, they want to, they want to talk to me. And so his, it's all about his mindset. And he is so willing to communicate with people that he does. And it's kind of amazing. Yeah. And um, uh, excuse me, my question is, but what else can we do when the indigenous people admire us because it happens a lot in Indonesia. They really like following us because we are look like a clever 
or a clever people or some uh, a person that can uh, are the person is that able to help them so they really admire us and expect us to do something so in this case sometimes we cannot uh, do like uh, listening or yeah yeah we we do listening but the ethics perhaps is rather low because they really like welcome to us mm, okay so right. this is mostly in indonesia so is it like uh people would just be like hey i like, really have to tell you my story or yeah yes just come to my place and then uh they really like to know our 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 suggestion or our our advice on with their lives sometimes yeah so, I, in a in a situation like that i always um i always tell people the dirty little secret of academics which is that we don't know anything we just spend a lot of time watching people who know stuff and okay. Isn't that true? I mean, we don't know anything yeah, about yeah. business. We yeah, just yeah. want businesses. Yeah. We, you know, I uh, the, some of you architects and planners and people with real skills, like you, you know how to do those things. Yeah, you know the the Deep building design. code. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, so and you know, it's and people think, oh, professors, they know all these things. There's no professor school where they teach you all those things. You learn them from other people who actually know them. So um, I always remind people that um, <clears throat> that what we do is we we watch the experts, which is them, and we that's where we gather our knowledge. So they shouldn't they shouldn't think too much of our knowledge because it's their knowledge, just kind of all tied up together. <clears throat> um, but you, Weedy, asked about um, what if what if you can't help people or. Is that sort of is that the the question I hear kind of sitting under there? Like, what do we do if they um, expect us to do something with them? Like, uh, can you help us to can you help us raise money for some drainage? No, no, no. But the more like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, because we are mostly we are architects, so they want to show us, and then uh, they they pr proud to to have us in their houses for example so they yes yeah, sometimes it's the 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 behavior sometimes is not really uh not really honest in the sense of because there are a lot of uh researcher coming so they know sometimes they also can predict what we want to know yeah, so this is not a natural answer. They they are staged to be, you know, responding to the researcher, right, Buidi? And then we yeah. don't get the 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 exact answer that we actually aiming for, and instead we kind of like noting on, uh, something that is already staged or, um, yeah, unnatural, so that our research become probably flawed. In, uh, the is that is that what you mean, Buidi? Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I always, I like to use storytelling. So um, when I think people aren't going to tell me authentically, mm -hmm. I will just say, tell me about the last year. What was it like? And then people will just, they can't stop themselves. It's kind of amazing. Do you find, find that? Like once they get talking, they just go. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it, I find that if, asking questions that are more general to a, a situation. So let's say over the past year, there's been an eviction and this family has survived an eviction. Mm -hmm. I might I might say, what are the, um, I, I, I can't think of an architecture question because I'm just not that good at architecture, but just imagining like, tell me, tell me how you built that, this, uh, you know, roofing system. I don't know. I, I'm, terrible I, I i work around architects all the time i should know more about architecture um but the yeah so i'll ask like tell me about the last year and mm -hmm. they already know i'm there because i'm the eviction lady and so um they know that and so that inevitably they'll they'll tell me something about that but but in the meantime they say 
well, we a year ago, where do we live? We were still at the other place and we had this terrible landowner. He was just a, a bully and, and, and they just start going. And I've actually had this work with people in government um, who told me things that I thought, boy, that's not in the policy. Um, <clears throat> when you get people talking, they just, uh, they, they have a way of opening. And the thing is people want to please you too, you know, or, or they want to block you out either way, like one or the yeah. other. So if people are there and they're like, oh, I want to tell you what you want to hear because, you know, I want you to be happy. I want you to get what you need and go away thinking you got what you need. Um, mm -hmm. So if you give people a way to talk about other things, <clears throat> they can forget that. What do okay. you normally do, Weedy? Uh, yeah, because I, mostly I do the res I do research on uh, urban city, uh, urban yeah people in the living in the urban. So it's not indigenous people. So I don't know. But once I went to the to Sumba, then I I realized they really like admire us. The children are following us, and then want to know what we are doing. And then uh, when we ask, uh, they said, oh, yeah, so, so. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's not really like, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking what else should we do if uh, if people really like admiring us? That's it. Stay longer. Play soccer. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's yeah. a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's easier said than done, yeah. Yeah, I think I think one of my friend um Tanzil um also um suggests that because he did that he kind of like um discussing about uh the 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 impacted informal settlement that have a very high tension with the government and initially uh the community kind of like treat him as part of the government that's why they kind of like built a very high wall you know between uh, their when they talk but then after getting along well, staying there longer, they kind of open up and then probably that's one of the way, yeah, Jennifer, I mean, making a relationship with the people. Yeah, listening to stories. There's a lot of like, you know, going to nighttime events if you feel safe. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of storytelling. And, yeah. the, you know, people in Vanuatu, they just like, the stories can be very repetitive. Yeah. They have to then take on a like, rather than a, I have to really remind myself to rather than go, why am I hearing this story again? <laughs> go, why are they telling it to me now? What's the, what's the reason it's here now? Yeah. Um, and sometimes I find that the story matters for what I'm thinking we're talking about at that moment, or it places something in context. Um, okay. All right. I think, uh, is that answering every idea? Yeah? Yes. I Thank have you. to cut it because we have still um, people question <laughs> asking question in the chat box. I think this is uh, oh quite a lot. Thank you, Buidi. Now I will read Pak Wilmar. Pak Wilmar's, um, yeah, he is not here anymore. I would like to invite him, but he's not here. So Pak Wilmar said, nice to see your presentation and to see you again after a decade of or so. I'm so sorry I cannot attend till the end as I have class at 10. What I got from the presentation is it all comes down to the use of different language to different audiences, either plain or polite languages. You probably have experience when talking to people in administration, which they don't like if we use certain terms, even though it's reality or com the communication to communicate the reality we found from our research to a wider audience, which don't live or even sense that the reality exists. Do you have oh. any yeah. <laughs> experience on that? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, um, I've been trying to convince UN Habitat for seven years that they should stop using the term informal settlements in the Pacific. And they don't listen to me. They keep producing things. <laughs> But I think that, um, I don't know, you, there are different kinds of people. And I think that um, there's another guy, I think guy maybe, or somebody who's an anthropologist who's here too. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, some people are just, some people are really willing to be the bold 
communicator and just, you know, say the hard things. And some people struggle with that. And um, so I think like, you know, always being authentic in the presence of the people who you're researching with and researching um, <clears throat> is important and, and reflecting their language um, and their values, if you can, and repeating it, you know, rather than insisting on one thing that happened when I was um, doing that uh, mission statement with the community is I wrote this word, I called them para-urban settlement. So you will, you will all recognize that P-E-R-I urban, so it means kind of the outside of the city. <laughs> and, um, and the, 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 the community was like, no, no, we don't like para-urban. We're part of the city. And I was like, well, yeah, para-urban means part of the city. It just means at the edge. And they're like, no, no, that's not us. They were like, we're sister community. So the, they're, they're like the sister's part of the family. And I was like, okay, like to me, sister community means like away somewhere else, but you know, like sister city. And they were like, no, no, sister community means part of the family. And so the people were willing to sort of be assertive and be forthright with the the translation of that um, that language. And and I really appreciated that because I wouldn't have known. Um, and you know, I I I don't know if this is still the case because um, when I was spending a lot of time in Indonesia. Uh, people, you know, people talk about the language Bahasa Indonesia and somebody, and I would, a lot of white people do this. They come to Indonesia and they're like, oh, like speaking some Bahasa. And then somebody pulled me aside and they were like, Jenny, that's not correct. And I was like, oh, thank you. And then now I hear even Indonesian people doing it. And I'm like, what's happening? Is it changed? Um, has it changed? Do people, do Ooh, people wow. still just, do people say Bahasa to refer to Bahasa Indonesia? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. Maybe. Yeah. So maybe it's like a, you know, maybe the culture is changing a little bit, and and some them some things are changing. But like, if you're one of those people that's really willing to hear hard things, people will tell them to you. Um, and then and like, some of the best people are just these infinite, infinitely curious. They're just the ones that go, oh, oh, I was dumb. Oh, thank goodness you told me. Okay, thank you. And and then if you work on that long enough, you can really mean it. Um, yeah rather than just playing, you know, like being willing to hear it, but mm, it hurts me. It makes me feel like I wasn't right. I was stupid. Yeah, you are. Like whenever you're dealing with a culture you don't know or people you don't know or a setting you don't know, you're the dumbest one there. You are literally the dumbest one there. So you're the one that knows the least. So that's great. That's, um, you know, but you have to embrace that role of being the dumbest one yeah. there. And if you can do that, then people will start to tell you stuff you never imagined. Um, and I got, I get the dumbest one there really at this point, I do it really well. Like I'm <laughs> <Play> like, dumb <laughs> or be dumb, like really be be dumb. dumb. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jennifer, thank you for the answer. Probably I will jump to, because actually I have Bu Inda's question, but Bu Inda is not be able to um, uh, grab a mic. Probably I will invite the next question first before back to the Bu Inda. I would invite Green Hill well, can you open mic and probably open cam if that's possible? Hello. Hi. Hi. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Please, <clears throat> your question. So should I read my uh, question again? Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, ethics is buried deep and deep within the uh, what we know as a cultural iceberg. It needs not, uh, it needs time and a lot of time to really comprehend what is ethics in uh, uh, a society or uh, uh, a person perhaps. So uh, how long should uh, research took place if uh, usually, anthropologists uh, delve deep uh, into uh, topics like these uh, while living in years, years uh, within a society. So uh, can we really finish our research uh, on time uh, because of this uh, uh, fact? Uh, perhaps uh, this is my question. All right. 
Thank you, Green Hill. Yeah. All right, Jenny. Green Hill, are you doing a, a PhD in, or a master's in anthropology? Or are you a uh, lecturer? I am doing a cultural uh, cross uh, theology studies. So I am deep inside uh, uh, people minds and uh, uh, cultural behavior according to their own uh, uh, religion. Oh, and so for a, lot of, <laughs> for a lot of planners, you know, that must sound like impossible. <laughs> Architects, <laughs> like us. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, you know, in, in planning <clears throat> research and built environment research, we often allocate two or three weeks to go to the field and spend time there. And one of the problems with the development apparatus is that, you know, people make field trips and they just go and stay in a nice hotel and drive around. And, and, and so I think Green Hills, you know, experiencing something, which is, you know, you've got to sit in that ethics committee for half a year and watch what they do at the, you know, at the visitor university or, um, <clears throat> but not everybody can do that. If you're doing a master's, you've got one year, you got to, you know, get that stuff in and done. If you're doing a PhD, you've got a little longer. Um, and if you're teaching, you've got to go. And so my, um, my journey was uh, that I, um, <clears throat> I started doing ethnographic field work in 2015 and I published my first, first article in 2017 um, on work that was in like the first month or two of that ethnographic work, but that I couldn't publish yet because I didn't know I didn't know what to what exactly what to write about it for like another year and a half. Um, <clears throat> so ethnography, for those of you who don't know, is I guess the uh, the tool of choice. Would you say Greenhill of anthropologists, um, yep. which involves just kind of being in the field. I think uh, the the formal term is just hanging around. Is that right? Uh, you know that spending a lot of time yeah. with the community of of interest. Yes. and um and getting to know it so and it's a i mean i don't unfortunately i can't i can't answer the question of how much how much time but um my strategy has been to repeat to just go back again and again to the place and i think that after a month of field work or two weeks of field work you can think of something to say or you can think of a question to ask that's appropriate to two weeks of field work. And then when you go back the second time to the same place and reconnect with the people again, and they tell you something deeper, um, then you now have four weeks of field work and, and a slightly deeper connection to people and maybe a bigger truth than you had before. And now you can write something that draws on all of that. And when you go back the third time, you, you're, you're, you're building your, ethnographic base with the community. So my strategy has been to repeat often. <laughs> um, and, you know, we do that between, between teaching or if you're doing a thesis, you do, you know, you go the one time and then maybe your, your, your doctoral thesis, you go back or you go back for a visit for the next, the next summer because you're going there anyway on vacation or because it's just down the road. A lot of people do ethnographic studies on, on what's just in their own their own backyard. So I think that what the what conclusions you can draw and the questions you ask should be appropriate to the time that you have. Yep, yep. So mm -hmm. yeah, I am uh, I am researching my own people right now. So I do know uh, what uh, the concept of uh, of ethics of our people. The problem is that uh, I am a Minasan. Uh, it is a, a, a tribe, a small tribe in the northern part of uh, Sulawesi Island. So the problem is that uh, our people have experienced uh, uh, research from uh, the West from the early 1800s. Mm. And uh, like, the, like uh, usually the story goes like this. Uh, it is, I believe it is happening. It happened a lot. So the research 
uh, that is conducted by the uh, uh, all of the smart people from the West. Uh, uh, they change our culture, not for the world, the, the best, but for the worst, because they really did not uh, delve deep enough inside the, the mindset of our culture. Uh, and when they publish their, uh, uh, their studies, uh, they publish their books, uh, our history change. Our history change. Uh, uh, today, uh, our people know our people from their books and their books are not correct. That, that's the problem with uh, yeah. if you did not spend enough time uh, learning about the core values of the people that you're searching. So I'm, uh, I'm suggesting that, uh, yes, we should spend more time, uh, perhaps uh, a year or so in the field. Uh, I think it, in, the, in the anthropological uh, perspective, one year is uh, uh, perhaps the threshold of you know getting to know <laughs> your yeah. subject, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I think I think yeah probably short um respond to that Jennifer because we still have um some questions. <laughs> it's fascinating that you are doing a self ethnography, Green Hill. It's um it's very courageous and wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I think this is thank uh, you one important point that Green Hill mentioned from his um, perspective and also probably his experience, yeah. I mean, that probably led also to ethical conduct. Thank you so much for sharing, Green Hill. Um, I will have to go back to uh, Ibu Inda's question. Sometimes the problem is also in institutional problem of getting ethic approval. Uh, the procedure took some costs too. Isn't it also potential another ethical problem on the side of the institution? And um, probably it costs a lot that probably we cannot uh, provide the financial. If we want to do, F, for instance, probably what she meant uh, is if everyone have to do ethical um, application, um, how we kind of like we go on that. Yeah, that's, um, you know, who does that? <laughs> the academics yes <laughs> so, <laughs> so um on top of all the things you already have to do uh those committees are um there and and that's part of what we consider in australia and in my experience in the u.s our duty um along with peer review uh is you know so that takes time and that's time you're not writing or teaching. Um, so you need staff that you know are that have appropriate workloads. So if the institution is going to require review, ethics review, um, then then it definitely needs to support the academic <laughs> staff to be able to do it. Yeah. And that might mean, you know, four and three classes instead of four. Um, the, the committees tend to rotate here. So uh, not everybody sits on the ethics committee all at once, but you tend to <clears throat> do kind of a rotation in every seven or eight years for mm. a year or two. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and then there needs to be someone administratively who collates it to, you know, put it in front of the committee. <clears throat> um, so that requires administrative support, like a, you know, a special coordinator who does that for us, um, who's very good at it and, and, um, and then records and sends the letters out and makes sure people have approval. Yeah. But it, yeah. ultimately, I mean, it's it's a lot about a culture of doing good considered ethics work, and that really starts with the advisor, you know, and the 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 person who wants to do it, making sure that you have a way to. I mean, ethics approval is enforcement, but you can do ethical work without the administrative apparatus of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it just takes a lot more personal reflection and drawing on your colleagues and on your um, your fellows. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. there's a distinction between the institutional application of ethics and and the enforcement of ethics and ethics, which are yeah. themselves, you know, how we govern ourselves and how we decide what the right way to behave is. 
Um, yeah. So, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Understood. So you suggest that we have to start from ourselves that we are doing it ethically, not only based on the paperwork that we do as an application, right? Yeah, because um, if Inda asked me to share our experience, I think I paid probably 4 million rupiah only for get, to get the, it is legalized as it is ethical, you know? Uh, yeah, so it's kind of a lot and I didn't really budget it. So it's kind of like, we kind of ha have a discussion. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, we don't, ours is free <laughs> in the institution. Mm. But does yeah. yours have to go outside of ITB or does it stay in ITB? I, well, I did it in other institutions. That's why I have, I have to pay. Um, but yeah, I mean, the cost is quite high. Um, yeah, probably that's something because we are not familiar yet, probably. Yeah. So we kind of like, mm, I don't know. I've heard of that. I've heard some institutions have a pay as you go, you know, you, you pay yeah. for the service. And that's reasonable because yeah. people's salaries have to be paid yeah. to do review. Um, so if the project has to pay a review process, then yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, but it can be really expensive and it can yeah. eat into your grant money, just like everything else. And all you want to do is out be playing soccer with the kids and, and <laughs> doing research. And yeah, yeah, we understand. Yeah. yeah. It's just probably not affordable for every researcher uh, that doesn't get grant that big enough to, you know, fund that probably. But yeah, I mean, your suggestion about going from our, yeah, yeah, we make sure ourselves that we do it ethically, kind of like, yeah, we don't need that, like, you know, that paper that says that it's ethical, but we know that it's ethical when we kind of like, uh, kind of um, have a consideration on what we're doing, research, kind of thinking of others. The one that, the thing that you mentioned in the lecture. Okay, uh, I have another, this is the last, question i think we are approaching the end uh to chandra i'm sorry i have to read it based on our based on your research how do we determine the timing of when you can make a decision to intervene in research and when you don't because qualitative research we must avoid constructive thinking and avoid making direct conclusion thank you so when we have to make intervention and not yeah um Chandra, I, I suspect you might be referring back to when I was doing field research in 2018 and this policy came out. <clears throat> I mentioned that in the lecture. Um, or you might be thinking of your own struggle um, about how to, when, when to start becoming an action researcher as opposed to just just a person they're observing, neither of which is wrong or bad or unethical, by the way. Um, but I think that but for me in that moment, what I realized this policy came out and I was doing consultations with communities or I was doing research on um, people's experience with evictions and what had happened to them and where they had gone. So where in the city they had scattered to. And, and this policy came out and and up to that point I didn't think there was any protection in the in the the law and there still isn't in the law too much um, but a policy which is kind of a vision a national you know a vision for what government policymakers think they want to do um, in the future but it hadn't been has still not been translated into the legal system yet <clears throat> um, but when this came out you know there was there was almost no question for me when I had more information, it actually was a really nice to be able to, at that point, start giving something back. Because up to that point, all I could do was say, I don't know what my research is going to do to help you. Um, I'm going to try to um, let policymakers know what's happening for people. And I'm going to try to help you tell your stories. <clears throat> but I didn't have a strategy. I wasn't like, okay, let's do a comic book. Or, you know, some people do that sort of thing. When people tell their stories, they do a graphic novel or um, do some community theater or something that's expressive for the community to help them explore what happened to them. That happens a lot in like psychology where people are experts um, and have like a theater arts background. So these are people who are experts in human psychology or like trauma. I'm not that person. I'm an urban planner. I'm just like, I make plans, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a person that knows what 
tra people's traumas, like how to help them face those things through theater or whatever. <clears throat> so finally, when, when I realized, when this policy came out, I was like, okay, this is something I can offer. Um, and I think that the, it took a while. It took a couple of years for me to have anything to offer. But when I did, I was like, I'm doing this. So I started to go around like every community I went to, I was like, do you want me to do a training on the policy? So I went and I printed out like 500 copies of the policy. Or I got 500 copies from the International Organization for Migration, IOM. I don't know if you know them. They're now like a UN branch, but at the time they, they were not affiliated with the UN, but they had printed all these policies. And I lugged these boxes around and handed them out to people and gave them highlighters and said, do this, like go to this page and look at this. If anybody ever comes to do an eviction, you can go to government and tell them like this, this, this policy actually has language of protection for people in our situation. We have to be resettled in a communicative, collaborative way. We have to be put in a better place. We have to have water and sanitation and um, schools and lights and <clears throat> all kinds of things. So there were, there were these ex um, explicit protections in the policy. For me that that was an exciting moment because I was like, okay, I can actually do something now that is contributing rather than just taking. And um, if you have the capacity to do that sooner, I think that Chalisa's ethics enables you to do it. I, I was a person with, I didn't know how to draw comic books. I didn't know how to stage plays. I didn't know how to help people do better designs for their houses. Some of the people here in this gathering have those skills. Um, so you can start offering something sooner you just build that into your research design. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna make a comic book and then people are gonna know about it. What does that, what does that do to my research? What does that mean for my research? Um, if you're Green Hill, it might mean that you're telling, you know, you're getting people to express more authentic stories about their past and, and to like compare how the past doesn't compare to the ethnographies that are out there um, and, how, and express how the ethnographies are wrong. So it could actually be useful for research as well. <clears throat> okay. All right, Jennifer. Um, I'm so sorry. What is it? I'm pointing it out since there is a statement that I got while doing research with indigenous community in Jipta Gelar, uh, which state, if you don't know something, you don't need to know something. If you already know something, you don't need to feel like you know best. I think that also something to do with your statement that should be uh, there should be limit for us to interrupting something during research, but interesting answer. So if the research output will produce criteria and parameter that can be applied to, do you have any suggestion about the best way to combine quantitative and qualitative research as well? Well, um, can you respond very exactly <laughs> on, on yeah, this? Um, because, uh, make yeah. sure you have a research question that addresses both qualitative research and quantitative research. You probably need two research questions. Um, and, um, and, and make sure that you design a process for each. And then you can do qualitative and quantitative work in the same setting. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, this kind of discussion can go forever. I mean, uh, this is a very interesting topic. I, you can see that so many people joining this lecture, more than 100 people. Um, I think they have, this, it shows that uh, this topic is very interesting for almost all of us uh, because it is um, related to the, what we're doing as an academic, um, which is research. I, but because it's already, 11 sharp so i have to wrap it up thank you so much jennifer for um sharing with us um, making time to join us here in the guest lecture series 2022 and i would like to uh, remind you all that this is not the last of our guest lecture series we have next week we have anoma pires uh uh in the first of november in the same time like today uh she will discuss about um how to do research in global south context because uh, as again this is uh, we have a very specific context of uh, global south so if you're interested join us and uh, just check in uh, on our instagram and other social media all right um thank you so much jennifer um, I'd, I'd love to to photo group but i don't know how actually anyone here can help me <laughs>
probably. Anyone of you? From the participant? Can anyone? Um, probably I can invite you all um, to turn on the camera. I will try to do it myself if hopefully it works. Um, let me, yes. Okay. Okay, so now um, I have how many pages? Four pages in my screen. Okay, where we can wait. Um, all right, uh, I will capture the first one. One, two, three. Wait, hold on. One, two, three. Wait, let me. Okay. Okay, and then second one, I'm so sorry, I'm so slow for this one because I'm not really expert in this. Okay, one, two, three. Next one, one, two, three. And the last one, one, two, three. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer, again, um, and every one of you that is already joining. We have beautiful students here and also lecturers. Thank you so much for coming. I'll see you next week on Anima's talk. Thank you. I wrap up Hello. with Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye-bye. Yes, see you, you again. so much. Yeah, next time should be in Indonesia.